Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. This year, I've become really interested in the idea of using my time better and ways to live my life with more intention. There is so much more to our lives than picking the perfect ETF or brokerage account. So I think it's important that we take the time to zoom out and look at the bigger picture of how we're designing the lives we want to live and investing both our time and money better. So I'm excited to introduce today's guest, Dr. Amantha Imba, who is an organizational psychologist and behavioral scientist. Amantha has just released her book, TimeWise, which is a guide designed to help dominate your day and level up your life using the secrets and habits from the world's most successful people. She's also the host of popular podcast, How I Work, where she interviews some of the world's most successful people about their habits, rituals, and strategies for optimizing their day. So in today's episode, we're going to be discussing ways to invest both your time and money better, whether money can buy happiness, and how to make better decisions when spending money and time. Amantha, thank you so much for joining me on the Australian Finance Podcast today. It's good to be here. It is wonderful to do another in-person episode. We were just talking off air about how fun it is to actually meet guests in person. It's so different. And I feel like, I know for me on the How I Work podcast, I've just got back to doing face-to-face interviews and it's just, it's a different level of rapport. I Mm. think you can build with guests. Um, So I I love it too. Yeah. Mm. And I think we've all had enough of Zoom or Google Meet over the last couple of years. Yes, definitely. And you've just launched a book last week, this week? Uh, a week ago, yeah. yes. How's it all going? It is great. It's a bit of a blur of um, <laughs> bookstore visits and interviews and media stuff, but it's it's been great. Like, I mean, when you write a book, it's it's almost like you're in a cave for mm. a year and you may be getting feedback from one or two people that visit you in the cave who are your editors <laughs> and they mark up your work like crazy yeah. and then you emerge from the cave and it's kind of like, oh, people are actually going to read this thing that I've been working on uh, a lot for the last year. So it's quite exciting. Yeah. yeah. I know a lot of people, including myself, have the dream to one day write a book. So it's quite <laughs> crazy that you've got a physical, tangible book that people can buy now. Yes. It's always weird when you receive that physical <laughs> copy. It's like, oh my God, it's real. It wasn't just in my imagination. So that's always exciting exciting. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to dig into the book and other things you've done in today's episode, but given we're a finance podcast and we all we talk a lot about investing your time and money better, I wanted to kick off with the question that I've been thinking a lot about recently and it's whether money can buy happiness and if so to what extent. Well, from a research point of view, it it can. So there's definitely a correlation up to, I think it's about $75,000 a year that money can make you happier. Then research has said it just plateaus after that, but recent research has said, no, it still actually does go up a bit. But I think it's where the happiness can come is how we use money. So, and and I guess this is quite a privileged conversation as Mm. well, because not everyone has discretionary um, spend. But to give you an example, like something I do in my own life is I think about how am I using my time in a way that is not the best use or doing things that frustrate me or irritate me or um, things that I just don't like doing. So as an example, a few years ago, I pre-COVID. My daughter and I used to go to an inner city market in Melbourne, food market, and do our shopping for the week every Saturday. And we are big fruit and vegetable consumers. I think between us, we would probably have like 15 serves a day, something crazy, (laughs) mental, right? And so what I would do is I love being organised and doing food prep in advance. I feel like that's quite an efficient thing to do. But I would literally spend hours in the kitchen after the market visit 
washing vegetables and fruit and cutting them up and packing them into Tupperware. <laughs> and one day I was just having a big whinge to my now ex-husband about this. And he said, why don't you just put an ad on Air Tasker? Surely someone could do this for you. And 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 that was that was a bit of an aha moment for me. And I'm like, yes, they could, couldn't they? And so I found this amazing university student who had a part time job doing food prep in a cafe. She had great knife skills, a lot better than mine. <laughs> and so I then started to have her come around for a couple of hours because she was much quicker than I was yep. cutting and doing the the food prep of the fruit and veggies um, for a couple of hours every Saturday. I'd pay her fifty dollars, and that was the best fifty dollars I spent. <laughs> like I could go out for a meal or get takeaway food or something like that for probably more money than that. <laughs> but I would much prefer to win back that time and 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 do it like do something more meaningful with that time like play um you know lego or some imaginary game with my daughter's toys for a few hours that i was saving through that use of 50 dollars yeah yeah it's we talk a lot about figuring out what your values are and actually using your time and money in line with those values but it does require a bit of time to actually work out how you should actually use these resources you have wisely it it, it certainly does and i think that like something that maybe some listeners know about is that we we think that buying products is a good use of time and, and money. And, and certainly sometimes it is. Uh, but research would suggest that if we can spend more money on experiences rather than products, that's definitely going to lead to more happiness. So mm. why that is, is experiences are generally meeting a higher order need, like social connection or mm growth or something like that. Products generally don't meet that kind of a need. And also experiences tend to create memories, whereas products less so. So if we can also skew our spending to experiences, that's a good thing. I can give you one final tip in terms of buying happiness with money um, (laughs) is like with with credit cards, the the thing with credit cards, as we all know, is you uh, buy now and pay later. but if we can actually pay now and consume later, we're going to get more happiness. Like a classic example of this is a holiday. Um, I I strongly recommend don't do last minute holidays because you're missing out on a good chunk of happiness. So the like when researchers have looked at when is our peak happiness during the holiday period from planning through to having the holiday through to after the holiday – the peak happiness often happens in the anticipation Mm. leading up to the holiday. So it's a really good idea when you're buying an experience to book it a little bit out, like ideally a few weeks, if not a few months out, because then you maximise the happiness that you're (laughs) going to experience. Um, Ironically, the lowest levels of happiness are on the actual holiday uh, and then we get a bit of a boost in happiness when we look back at the holiday. Yeah, it's interesting. We get so much. We actually get a lot of happiness, even just in the office right now. We're talking about holidays in January, but we're already thinking, oh, where are we going to go and researching places and talking yes. to people in the office. So this stuff doesn't cost any money, but it's bringing you a lot of happiness in the meantime. Mm. So that's quite interesting. And it'll be interesting to hear from listeners if they have done the um, plan for a year in advance versus a last minute holiday, the difference in happiness that gave them. Mm, definitely. Now, given your book's called Time Wise, and I feel like we often feel time poor, what are some ways that we can feel like we've got more time in our day, our week, and our month if we're feeling like we're getting to the end of every week and going, where did my time go? It is a very common response, I feel like, to a work day, to finish <laughs> yeah. the day and go, what did I actually get done today? Um, I'm imagining you've maybe had that experience yeah, yourself. Yeah, even during sort of a month and you go, what happened this month? It just flew past. Like this year's flying really quickly. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. I'm almost like, oh, what, what month are we in? Oh, <laughs> July. in July. That's right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. We're it's halfway crazy. through winter in Melbourne. That that I do know. Um, <laughs> so look, that there's a lot of I think there's a lot of actionable tips in TimeWise to solve that challenge around Mm. using our time more wisely and more intentionally. But one that I specifically love in terms of overcoming that problem of getting to the end of the day or the end of the week or the end of the month and going, 
oh my gosh, what did I actually <laughs> achieve? What did I actually do? Mm. Um, comes from this guy called Jake Knapp. And Jake used to work at Google and Google Ventures, which is their investment arm. And he thought a lot about time. And Jake, when he was at Google, he used to be ruled by his to-do list. So his life was pretty much just going through his to-do list and ticking off items and he would kind of get to the end of the day and it would feel um, just not very meaningful and not very memorable. And so he decided to experiment with something else. So instead of just the day being ruled by his to-do list, what he thought is he thought wouldn't it be great to reflect on every day and go, this was the highlight of today. Mm. And so what he does is at the beginning of the day he thinks, what would I like that highlight to be? What would I like to reflect back on at night and go, ah, oh, I did that and that was really cool. And then he'll schedule that in his diary. It's typically a 60 to 90 minute task or project or activity that the highlight will be and that will be his priority. So mm -hmm. above anything else that day, he will make sure he gets that highlight done. So reverse engineering his day in a way. Exactly, exactly. Reverse engineering the day so <laughs> that he guarantees there will be a highlight of the day. And yep. often it's a work highlight, but other times it, it might be something in his personal life as well. So I think he does this on weekends too. And so I think it's a really great strategy to think about when you start your day, thinking about yourself at the end of the day and going, what would I like today's highlight to be? And mm. putting that in your diary. Yeah, I that might help me because I've tried so many times to get away from the endless to-do list and I've tried cal calendar blocking after reading Indistractable by Nia Ayal last year and we actually interviewed him on the podcast, but I just cannot seem to get away from the endless to-do list. I don't know if you've got any tips for me. <laughs> the endless to-do list. I do have a few chapters in TimeWise <laughs> about to-do lists because I'm a big fan of to-do lists, but one of my favourite tips in the book about to-do lists comes from Rachel Botsman and she she's kind of like a global thought leader around trust and technology. Mm. She's a trust fellow at Oxford University and something that she started doing and doing more frequently when the pandemic hit is actually creating a to-don't list. So she used to do this about once a year where she would think about, you know, her, her year and go, what does she not want to do the following year? But she realised when the pandemic hit and she stopped spending a lot of her life on a plane and doing travelling is how much she really hated travelling and how much she really liked being at home. And so mm. she started this monthly ritual where at the end of every month she'll reflect on the month that has just gone and she will think about what are the things that really drained her of energy and she'll put them on her to-don't list. So <laughs> I, I love that strategy. I've adopted a, a similar kind of strategy where yeah. on the first Monday of every month I've literally, literally got four to five o'clock in the afternoon blocked out to do a reflection on the month that has just gone and think about okay, what sucked me of energy and what do I just not want to do? <laughs> and if you find a few things on those lists and some things that you might actually have to keep doing, um, like your financial admin or things like that, how do you manage that? Is that something you try to outsource or is there a way to bring more, uh, I don't know, joy to your financial admin? <laughs> Something I think a lot about is what's the best use of my time. There's a chapter in the book about thinking, you know, with the way that you use your time, particularly with work, but also non-work activities and, you know, often our our life admin and mm. finance admin is something that actually falls in non-work hours, I guess, in a lot of people's minds, yeah. is thinking about um, – uh, and this comes from Perry Marshall, who's uh, who's an American, um, quite famous uh, business consultant. And he says, think about what are the $10 an hour tasks that you do, the $100 an hour tasks that you do, $1,000 an hour tasks that you do, and the $10,000 an hour tasks that you do. So really thinking, what is the most valuable use of your time and your skills and what is the least valuable? And I'd say for a lot of people, doing financial admin is probably not a good use of people's time. Uh, and particularly, um, you know, if, if it's doing things that are repetitive or if you could write a process for somebody else to follow like a virtual assistant, it can be a really good idea to outsource those $10 an hour tasks. So if, for example, something I think about, and we've got an amazing virtual assistant at Inventium, which is the behavioral science consultancy I, I founded um, 15 years ago, 
is for, I think the last five years we've had Elaine and whenever anyone on the team is like becomes aware of a task that's quite administrative in nature but also quite repetitive, quite monotonous, uh, it would be not too difficult to develop a process or a procedure for somebody else to follow. Uh, we always encourage people to do that and give it to Elaine who's amazing um, and, uh, you know, the, the rate that we pay her, she's located in the Philippines, um, we absolutely pay her above market rate, but when we compare that to the Australian economy, it's much more cost effective. Mm. Uh, so I think, you know, like you, you don't have to um, have your employer pay for a virtual assistant. I think that people just in their personal lives can really benefit from finding someone um, who is in an economy that's different from the Australian economy, still pay that person a really good wage or salary or hourly rate and remove a lot of things that are just not the best use of our time. Yeah. And what what if we had some things that we couldn't outsource? Maybe we have to call the bank personally to renegotiate our mortgage and that could be a $10,000 an hour task. Do you recommend like bunching a few of these things up and just getting them out of the way once a month? Yeah. Look, batching batching like tasks with like tasks is definitely a good productivity strategy. Uh, like for example, Batch processing emails is quite a common productivity hack. Um, a less common productivity hack is batching meetings together, which I write about in TimeWise, um, because if we have meetings scattered throughout the day, our researchers found that we actually become 22% less productive in the hour <laughs> leading up to that meeting. Which, I, I believe that stat. They can be very disruptive. <laughs> yes, they can be. And it's like you don't really want to get into flow or you know do any kind of deep focused work because you're just going to get jolted out of it by the meeting. Um, and likewise, with life admin tasks, like getting on the phone to your bank, for example, there might be a few life admin tasks that you've been putting off and then, you know, maybe having like an hour of power at the end of the month or, um, you know, maybe if, if they're tasks that you find really hard to do, maybe scheduling it for when you've got peak energy for, you know, most people that's in the morning, uh, that can be a really good thing to do. Yeah. And if we want to start making better decisions, because we talk about making good financial decisions a lot, but maybe just better decisions in general without the way we allocate our time and our money. Do you have some strategies that listeners could try out? Definitely. I think a lot about decision making and there are a few chapters in TimeWise that are all about very simple ways to make better decisions. One of my favourites comes from Toria Pitt and something she uh, something she was kind of realising was an issue in her life is that she would get asked to do things, like let's say speak at an event in six months' time. And in six months' time, most of our calendars look pretty empty, like there's not <laughs> much going on. And so we're like, okay, I'll say yes because life is quiet then, so I yeah. feel fine about that. But then what inevitably happens is our diary fills up and the event comes around and we're like, why did I say yes to that? <laughs> um, it's the last thing I feel like doing. So yeah. what Toria does is she has a rule that she calls the next Tuesday rule where she will ask herself if this thing that I'm being asked to do to spend my time on is like was happening next Tuesday, how would I feel about it? Mm. And if she'd feel really excited if it was happening next Tuesday, she says yes. But if she you know, would feel anything less than excited, she says no. And I think it's a really good gauge. Like, you know, it yeah. might be a party even in our social life that we're being invited to. It might be attending a conference for work. Um, it could be all sorts of things that take up time, um, mm. whether that be in our work or our personal lives. So think about how would you feel if it was happening next Tuesday when your diary is probably pretty crazy busy. Uh, I like that one. Yeah, because yeah, it's feel a good lot bad? easier to say yes to something if we don't pay the price in time or money until six months in the future. Whereas yes. if we thought about it, what's going to actually happen next week? No, oh, I think I'll try that one out. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Was there any others? There's another one that I really like uh, from John Zaratsky, who, uh, who's also an ex-Googler like Jake. They used to work together. <laughs> and he has a strategy that he calls the iceberg yes. It's kind of tapping into a similar thing because often when we get asked to do something, uh, we can often just focus on the exciting part of it. Uh, you know, and like a presentation is, is 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 a really easy example to give. If we're asked to give a presentation, we can think about, you know, 
being in the glory of all those people and, you know, the audience coming up to us afterwards and going, that was great. <laughs> um, and and it can be really tempting to say yes when you focus on um, just the tip of the iceberg, the exciting mm. part of the thing that you're being asked to do. But what we forget is everything that lies below the surface, all the hard work that is involved in the lead up to doing that thing that we're being asked to do. Uh, so I I had this happen to me a few years ago. Um, I have this happen to me a lot and I use this strategy a lot because yeah. I feel like I can be um, sucked in by uh, shiny objects. Um, but I was asked to uh, be on this committee for a prestigious business school to review their MBA program. And I thought about, oh, that sounds that sounds like lots of glory involved in that and lots of impact that I can have on these future MBA students, some of which we had employed. And so I said yes immediately. I didn't think it through. But what I didn't think about is what sat below the iceberg, which was tens of hours of meetings in a stuffy university boardroom uh, where minimal progress got made mm. and um, – where lots of different voices and points of view wanted to be heard and I just got to the end of those meetings and thought, what have I said yes to? This Mm. is killing me. Uh, So I love the iceberg, yes, because it helps avoid um, all the stuff that sits below the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I feel like that could be quite useful for our finances as well because we often uh, get involved in something just because of the shiny object at the top and we don't actually properly think through the decision and all the uh, intricacies involved below it. Absolutely, yes, yes. I I think you can apply it to so many things (laughs) in life to make better decisions. Awesome. Now, I hear you've got some thoughts on why our current method of goal setting is broken. Yes. So goal setting and particularly smart goals uh, are quite popular in productivity circles. I remember that from high school. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Good old smart goals. Turns out they're not so smart. So when we think about goal setting, um, and I got this advice from Professor Adam Alter, who's uh, a professor at the Stern School of Business at NYU. And he he says goal setting is broken because when we set a goal, and let's just say um, it's to like save up, I don't know, $50,000 for a deposit on a home. Um, Until you reach that goal, until you have $50,000 or whatever your goal is saved up in the bank, you are failing. You are failing, failing, failing. When you've saved up $40,000, you're still failing. And Mm. that is a really demotivating state to be in. And then when we hit the goal, sure, we've got success, but how often do we like, you know, really truly celebrate success and sit in that success for a long time. We don't. We just move on to the next goal. And so we're back into a failure state. So what Adam says is a much better way to approach goals is, sure, have an idea of your end point, but instead of focusing on that, focus on setting a system that's ideally a daily or weekly system that will ultimately get you to that end point. So it might be a system for saving up for a deposit on a home, might be going, every week um, I'm only going to have, you know, one coffee rather than two and I'm going to put that, you know, $30 or $40 or however much it um, equates to into a savings account. And I know that if I do that every week for X number of weeks that I'm eventually going to reach that goal. So think about what is your system? Maybe your system is saving a percentage of your salary every week and putting that straight into account. So, um, you know, you can apply it to all sorts of things like a work goal might be um, I have to write this report um, and instead of just focusing on the end state of this report that you're failing at until that report is written and delivered, think about, okay, well, every day I'm going to spend half an hour on working on this report or every day I'm going to write 200 quality words um, that are going to contribute to this report. And I know that by this point in time, I will have got to that end point because the system gets me there. Yeah. I think that's quite good because the financial goals we set can often seem very overwhelming at the start, especially for listeners who are saving up for a house deposit or wanting to build their portfolio. And so, yeah, you can feel like you're you're never really reaching that goal until you finally hit that number. And that could be five or 10 years down the track, but you don't get to enjoy all those small milestones in the meantime. Exactly. You can celebrate a system every day if it's a daily system and you're sticking to it. And what if, what if something happens and you realise you're not on track to reach your goals? Because I guess even with those SMART goals, when they're realistic, sometimes life changes and you end up not actually achieving the goal 
at the pace you thought. What would you do to sort of reframe or uh, change your goals so you can still achieve something? I would actually relook at the system. So if your life has changed and you're like, "Mm, I don't think that that system is actually achievable now on a daily basis, I would reflect on, well, what does seem achievable given my life has changed? So it might mean that it's going to take longer to get to that end state, but you're not going to be beating yourself up if you're kind of missing that daily system. So review the system as opposed to the end state because presumably there's a reason for the end state. Yeah. Yeah, and our emotions play a big role in goal setting and decision making and sometimes they play a role to our detriment. And so what are some ways we can overcome maybe things that are making us procrastinate or put off doing certain tasks or working towards certain goals? There is a lot about procrastination in the book. There's particularly a lot around digital distraction Mm -hmm. and being really attached to our devices. So one of uh, one of my favourite strategies in the book comes from Kevin Rose, and he's uh, he's quite a high profile venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, and he became aware of just how often he was reaching for his phone quite mindlessly for for no purpose other than just to pick it up out of habit. And when he looked at his behaviour, he was picking up his phone a hundred times a day or thereabouts, which is actually not that much. The average person picks up their phone about two hundred times that is a day. Terrifying. It's terrifying. It's so <laughs> terrifying. Probably do it too. <laughs> <laughs> but at least you haven't during this podcast interview, which is very <laughs> polite. Um, so he thought about how could he reduce those mindless pickups and mindless checking of his phone. And so what he did is he got a rubber band and he tied it around his phone horizontally. And so what it would mean is that he couldn't actually unlock his Mm -hmm. phone to check it without removing the rubber band. So putting an obstacle in the way, which made him think twice about, do I really actually need to check my phone? And so through that very simple strategy, he reduced his pickups from 100 per day to 30 per Mm. day. Um, and if you want to get really hardcore, get a second rubber band and like make a cross <laughs> with the rubber bands. I have tried that and that really does put you off picking up your phone. Okay. I'll definitely give that one a go because, yeah, you just do it in moments where you want to fill the silence or fill the void when you're just waiting for your coffee. Suddenly you're looking at your phone, not for any particular reason. It just becomes a habit. Oh, my gosh. It does. It does. And look, another another thing that I found really useful for myself, which I... This is also in the book. It's uh, it's around creating a distraction-free phone. So basically creating a boring phone. Because why phones are very exciting is because most people have lots of social media apps on their phone and lots of apps that have an endless scroll yep. um, that you never, ever get to the end of. Um, and we also have apps like our email account, which... Um, we can check and find out how many people love us and want something from us and that makes us feel really good. And so if you can think about what are all the apps on your phone that are hijacking your attention and that you're finding really compelling and engaging and basically delete all those apps off your phone, you will create a very boring phone and um, you'll just be left with your sort of utilitarian apps, things that are actually useful like... Um, your torch uh, or um, the weather. Uh, and it's like, you know, there's only so much time you can spend looking at the um, at the weather app yeah. uh, before you just switch off your phone. So, mm. yeah. My current hypothesis is that apps like TikTok and Instagram and Uber Eats and Netflix are killing our ability to focus. I haven't looked at any of the science behind that, but it's what I'm blaming for not being able to read my law textbook for five hours at once. <laughs> is there any truth behind that? Oh, there's so much truth behind that. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, like the, the apps are designed in a way to to, to, to grab our attention. They're, they use, and I'm, I'm sure if you had Nia Eyal on, on mm. the show, I, I, I know Nia, um, I know Nia um, somewhat well, uh, he would have spoken about this um, in that the way apps are designed, they're designed on what's called an intermittent reinforcement schedule where we don't get a reward every time we look at the app. Like there's not always a new like of the really cute picture that we just posted, but there sometimes is. It's intermittent or random. And that's the most addictive, um, like positive reinforcement schedule that we can create. It's like how pokies are designed. And, you know, look, any kind of gambling device is designed to give you rewards 
sometimes, but you don't know when. It's completely unpredictable, which brings you back for more and more and more. It's actually far less addictive if you get a reward every single time. Mm. Uh, So they're deliberately designed in that way. There's hundreds of people that are working on how to make these apps as addictive as possible because the more people they get using them for a longer period of time, the more money the companies make. So uh, I think the best way to fight back instead of using your willpower and just saying to yourself, I'm not going to check social media every hour or every 10 minutes or whatever it is, just delete the apps because then you're not relying on willpower. And if you, say, only access them on a desktop, which is what I... um, tend to do. Um, at the moment, I do have Instagram on my phone, which is quite unusual. Um, but uh, but I, and I do find when I do have it on, um, I just get sucked in by it. Yep. But mostly it's not on my phone, nor is email, which was another thing that sucks me in. Um, <laughs> it's like it makes it so much easier to not succumb to digital distractions. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have to try some of those things like the rubber band because even putting it in a different room sometime doesn't help. (laughs) You still feel that pull towards it. And I feel like you should be in control of the phone, not letting the phone be in control of you. That is the ideal situation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, look, there's another, um, uh, I think they're called brute force strategies in in time-wise. And I got this one from Tim Kendall, who used to be the president of Pinterest. And something he tried doing is he got this device called a K-Safe. And a K-Safe is actually a device originally used for people on a diet where it's it's an opaque box and it's got a timer and a lock on it. And if you're on a diet, maybe um, chocolate is your vice. And so you put the chocolate into the K-Safe if you're having an urge to eat the chocolate. Yeah. And you set the timer for, you know, let's say an hour, maybe for the urge to um, to pass, and then the box will unlock itself after an hour. And so he started putting his phone in the box um, for about 6 o'clock at night to 8 in the morning so that he could be really present with his family and not be tempted to check his phone. Yeah. Uh, So I love these strategies that they're not relying on willpower because Mm. willpower is a limited resource, whereas, you know, unless you're pretty handy with breaking locks, a case safe is hard to get into. No, that sounds like quite good because, as you said, willpower is limited and we only, like, we can only make so many decisions in a day. So we often, if the phone's just lying there when we wake up, we just grab it instead of going through that nice morning routine that we've always wanted to do. Exactly. Yeah. Do you have any tips on setting like good morning and evening routines? Because I know people always write books and want to read about this sort of thing. (laughs) Yeah. uh, I mean, it's so funny, like all the articles. I mean, I click on them myself. Like if I see an article, you know, the 52 things that the celebrities morning routine. Celebrities do before 5 (laughs) a.m. or whatever. I'll be clicking on it. Um, But look, I think it is really thinking about what works for you and also thinking about are you a morning person, in which case having a morning routine um, is something that's going to be fairly easy to stick to because you're not working against sleep inertia, which is that foggy feeling that you get Mm. if your alarm is waking you a little bit earlier than you would naturally wake. Um, But uh, look, I I feel like Les has actually written about nighttime routines. Mm. And look, a, a, a nighttime routine that I have with my daughter that I find really good and it's one of those things that's really stuck in my life is, um, you know, I've obviously like read a lot about the importance of gratitude, as I'm sure listeners have. We all know gratitude is important. And it makes us, you know, feel happier and yep. so on. So much research to support that. Um, a lot of research to support writing a gratitude journal. Um, and I have tried that many, many times, but I haven't been able to make it stick, even though I literally read research about habit change and behaviour <laughs> change every day of my life. It just does not stick. But something that did stick, um, I got this tip from uh, Lisa Leong, who uh, is the host of This Working Life and a good mate of mine. And she does a ritual with her family called Rosebud Thorn. And what this is, is a nightly ritual. She does it with her family. I do it with my daughter every night. And it's going through rosebud and a thorn. So a rose is something that is like the highlight of your day, something that you're really grateful for that happened during the day. The bud is something that you're looking forward to because it's a bud, it's, you know, growing Mm. in the future. And the thorn is something that is a stressor or a problem um, or something, you know, not great that that happened that maybe you want to ask for help Mm. with. And so I do that with my daughter every night and – 
And I find that it's it's something that's stuck in terms yeah. of thinking about what am I what am I really grateful for and what was the highlight of my day. Do you think it's been easy to stick with that because you're doing the habit with someone else? Yeah, I think that that does make it easier because it's ingrained in our evening rituals. So we will, you know, typically do bath time and then we'll go to bed and we'll be chatting in bed and then I'll be like, okay, rosebud thorn time. Mm. Um, and then we do that and, uh, and, and and that's just, it's become quite ingrained in both of us and then we do silent reading time where we'll both just sit in bed and read mm. and then um, then it's lights out. So, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, having someone else to keep you accountable is also um, quite helpful with these things. Yeah, because I know a lot of listeners with their finances, if they work together with their partner or a sibling or they find a friend to go with this through this journey with, it helps them stay on track because they've got someone to check in with their goals and their progress with and they're not just doing it alone. Mm, definitely. And I think that a lot of people are very motivated when there's some external point of accountability. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I know that um, I find that quite quite helpful when yeah. I've said to someone I'm going to do this by this date I will always stick to it mm. yeah well now we've shared so many great tips and strategies in today's episode but before we wrap up I know you've spoken to so many people on your podcast how I work and you've had such great conversations there are there any other strategies from you or some of your amazing guests that you wanted to share with my listeners I'll share one other one that I do use quite a lot. And I think it's relevant now that, you know, this year we've kind of been coming out of our caves of lockdown, particularly in Melbourne being the lockdown capital of the world. And we're going to events and it's it almost feels like we're relearning how to socialise and <laughs> how to talk to people yeah. that we don't know. And I personally get quite nervous at events where I don't know anyone. And I got this strategy from Marissa King, who's a professor of social dynamics and social behaviour at Yale, and this stuck with me and it is my go-to strategy whenever I'm going to an event where I don't really know anyone that well. So what she says is, um, firstly, it can be really easy when you walk into a room to see it as an ocean full of people. And she said, that's your first mistake, they're islands. People cluster in groups and generally quite small groups. And then she said, what you want to do and this is the the great part of the tip, is you want to look for the odd-numbered groups. So people naturally communicate in dyads, so one-on-one, like we've got two ears, two eyes, we're designed to just communicate one-on-one. And so if there's, say, a group of three or a group of five, there'll always be at least one person on the outer. Definitely in a group of three I find is easiest. There will be someone who is on the outer. And so if you can identify those odd-numbered groups, go up to them, See if you can identify who's on the outer and then it will be very natural to break off with that person okay. and start a new conversation yep. uh, and, and feel comfortable in that conversation. So I always look for odd-numbered groups whenever I go to events now. Huh, that's such a good tip. I've never <laughs> thought of that. Because, yeah, usually there's if you do have a group, there's always someone that's nodding along and not actually talking in the conversation. So... Ah, that's a good strategy. (laughs) Well, I'll have to give that a go. If any listeners have tried that, let me know. I'll be very interested to hear it. Now, if people want to keep working on getting back in control of their time and their life and feel a bit more in control now that we're out of lockdowns and we've got a bit more autonomy over our lives, where can they find a copy of your book, TimeWise? Yeah, so you can get TimeWise really wherever you buy books from. Um, And then How I Work, the podcast that the book is based on, is available probably on the app that you're listening to this podcast on right now. Yes, yes, I'm sure it is. And I've heard there's signed copies at Dimmicks in Melbourne, so that's my favourite store. (laughs) Yes, there's lots of signed copies at a lot of Dimmicks stores. (laughs) Wonderful. Well, Amantha, thank you so much for joining me on the Australian Finance Podcast today. Thanks so much for having me.